Hi guys, welcome to my channel. You've all probably heard about the famous Newton's laws of motion. But has it ever come to your mind what the discoveries are that have led up to Newton's work? This video talks about just that. Prior to Newton, there have been many philosophers that have contributed to this great history. Among them, the two most important names that have had major influence on Newton's work, especially in mechanics, are the Greek philosopher Aristotle and the Italian physicist and mathematician Galileo Galilei. It all started with Aristotle in the 4th century BC. Yep, you heard that right, 4th century BC, that is about 2400 years ago. And it was then when Aristotle proposed his law of motion and that understanding of motion stuck for about 2000 years until Galileo realized the fallacy in Aristotle's law. Galileo's work marked significant departure from Aristotle's philosophy and renewed the understanding of physics as we know it today. This story is a great example of how science builds on incremental steps. As they say, failure is part of the process. While some steps may go wrong, and they will go wrong, nevertheless, they are important and integral in solving the bigger puzzle. In this video, we'll talk about Aristotle's law of motion, Aristotle's fallacy, and then we'll see how Galileo recognized Aristotle's mistake and came up with his law of inertia, eventually influencing Newton's work. Let's dive in. Newton had built his three laws of motion by standing on the shoulders of the giants. There are two prominent works that affected Newton's discoveries. The first is the Aristotle's law of motion that Aristotle had arrived in the 4th century BC. And the second is the Galileo's law of inertia that he had arrived towards the end of 16th century or the beginning of 17th century AD. As you can see, the difference between these two discoveries are about 2000 years. That means Aristotle's law of motion was the only understanding of motion mankind had for around 2000 years. So now let's explore both these discoveries. Aristotle arrived at his law of motion purely by observing nature. To get the gist of Aristotle's understanding of motion, let us consider a simple example of a car moving in a straight line. If I want the car to move in a uniform velocity, I have to continuously apply external force on it. However, as soon as I stop applying external force, the car ceases to move and slowly comes to a state of rest. It is observation like this that made Aristotle conclude that external force is required to keep the object moving. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is the Aristotle's law of motion. Now, let us consider two consequences of this law. The first is, if you have an object traveling at a uniform velocity, you need to apply external force so as to maintain its velocity. As per Aristotle, higher the velocity at which an object is traveling, higher is the force that is required to maintain its velocity. Now this does not look like a completely crazy idea because think about this. If you are driving on a freeway at a 60 miles per hour, you still have to press the paddle of the accelerator so as to maintain that velocity. If you take your feet off of the paddle, the car slowly comes to a state of rest. The second consequence is the flip of the first consequence. That is, higher the force acting on the object, greater is its velocity. And this has a direct implication on the objects that are subjected to the force of gravity. As per Aristotle, heavy objects fall faster than the light objects. And this can be illustrated with a very simple example. Now, for the purpose of demonstration, let us consider two objects, a heavier book and a lighter balloon. As per Aristotle, if I drop these two objects simultaneously, the book would move faster than the balloon and therefore reach the ground first, before the balloon. So let's see what happens. Let's drop these two objects together. One, two, three. So clearly, the book fell first, followed by the balloon. Mathematically, Aristotle's law of motion implies that the force is directly proportional to the velocity. That is, if an object is traveling at a higher velocity, higher amount of force is required to maintain that velocity. Or equivalently, higher the force acting on the body, 
higher is its velocity. As we saw in examples, Aristotle's law kind of makes sense in terms of pure observations. But although they seem right, they are not right. So what is Aristotle's fallacy? Where did Aristotle go wrong? Well, Aristotle did not realize the existence of frictional force. When you release the accelerator of the car, the car comes to a halt because of the frictional force which is acting in the direction opposite to its motion. And Aristotle also ignored the effect of air resistance, which is higher on the lighter object than the heavier object. Now what this means is, if you don't have frictional force, then the car moving at a uniform velocity will move forever at that velocity. And this also means that if you ignore air resistance, then the heavier and lighter object would both fall with same velocity. And we can see this with a very simple example. As we saw in the last demonstration, the balloon reaches the ground later than the book. And this is because the effect of air resistance is higher on a lighter object like balloon than on the heavier object like a book. And therefore, if we can get rid of air resistance, then both these objects, a heavier and a lighter object, would reach the ground at the same time. But that would also mean that we'll have to get rid of all the air in this room, which I don't think is a good idea. So what we'll do is, we'll place the balloon on top of the book and let the book fall so that it gets rid of all the air underneath it. And the balloon eventually is not subjected to any air resistance. And by doing so, we expect that both these objects reach the ground almost at the same time. So let's see if that happens. One, two, three. Clearly, the balloon and the book reach the ground at the same time. What this means is, Aristotle did not consider the effect of air resistance. So if you can remove air resistance, then both these objects or an object with any mass do travel at the same velocity over time. Galileo Galilei made this exact observation through his experiments that he conducted towards the end of 16th century or the beginning of 17th century. He investigated the motion of a ball on an inclined surface and he noticed that the ball going uphill slows down, that is it experiences retardation, whereas a ball moving downhill speeds up, that is it accelerates. And Galileo concluded that a ball moving on a frictionless horizontal surface must neither have acceleration or retardation. That is, the ball moving on a frictionless horizontal surface must have uniform velocity. And in one of his other experiments where Galileo investigated motion of a ball on a double inclined surface, he made the following observations. First, when the ball is released from the state of rest on one of the inclined plane, it rolls down and then it goes on to climb the other inclined plane. If the surface is smooth, then the final height of the ball is almost same as the initial height of the ball, perhaps a little less. And Galileo hypothesized that in an ideal situation where there is no friction at all, then the final height of the ball should be same as the initial height of the ball. And the second observation that Galileo made is that if you decrease the slope of the second plane and repeat the experiment, the ball still reaches the same height. However, in order to do so, it has to travel larger distance. Now what that means is, if you keep decreasing the slope of the second plane, the tendency of the ball is to keep traveling so that the final height of the ball is the same as the initial height of the ball as long as there is no friction. And in order to do that, it will keep traveling larger distance. And there will be a limiting point where the slope of the second surface is zero. That is, the second surface has become horizontal. And when that happens, the ball will move on forever, that is, its motion never ceases. Based on these experiments, Galileo made the following conclusions. First is that the state of rest and the state of uniform velocity are equivalent. In both these states, there is no net external force acting on the body. That is, when the object is at a state of rest or traveling at a uniform velocity, then the sum total of all the external forces acting on that object is essentially zero. The second observation that Galileo made is that the object resists the change in its motion by virtue of inertia. And this effectively is Galileo's law of inertia. 
And finally, through his other experiments, Galileo also observed that the object subjected to gravity experiences constant acceleration irrespective of their masses. Galileo's work was the final blow to Aristotle's law of motion. Sir Isaac Newton was heavily influenced on Galileo's work. He built on Galileo's ideas to come up with his own laws of motion. Firstly, Newton formalized the first law of motion by using Galileo's idea of inertia. And secondly, Galileo noticed that the acceleration due to gravity is constant and that the distance traveled by the object under gravity is proportional to the square of the time that it had traveled. Newton used this observation to come up with his second law of motion as well as to understand the nature of gravitational forces. Obviously, the natural extension of Aristotle's and Galileo's work is Newton's laws of motion. So stay tuned for our next upcoming video, which is going to be about Newton's three laws of motion. And we are going to go in extreme details about what these laws actually mean. All right, time for summary. In this video, we have talked about two historically significant events in the history of physics. The first was the discovery of Aristotle's law of motion in the 4th century BC. Aristotle proposed that an external force is needed to keep the object moving. And therefore, as per Aristotle, force is directly proportional to velocity. Aristotle obtained his law of motion purely by observing nature. And while doing so, he did not realize that the forces like friction or air resistance are in fact external forces, which could bring about change in state of the motion of an object. Galileo realized fallacy in Aristotle's understanding of motion through series of his experiments, and he proposed his law of inertia. Galileo's most important contribution was to propose that the objects tend to resist their change in state of motion. That is, if they are traveling at a uniform velocity, they would want to continue doing so. And this property of objects is very inherent to their existence and is called as inertia. One very critical idea that is easy to miss is to understand that for an object to maintain its state of motion, it is not necessary that there are no external forces acting on the object. You can have external forces acting on the object. However, the requirement is that the sum total of all the forces acting on the object must vanish. That is, when there is no net external force acting on the object, then the object by virtue of inertia tends to maintain its state of motion. However, if there is net external force acting on the object, then it compels the body to overcome its inertia and bring about a change in its state of motion. And we will learn more about this in our next video where we will talk about Newton's laws of motion. This brings us to the end of our discussion. And I'll be posting reading material for this discussion on my website, link down below. And if you have learned something new, then do not forget to like and subscribe. And stay tuned for more upcoming content. And until then, more power to you.